Chapter 11 The night the police came to the Mackenzie's front door was the same night a renegade tornado tore the rooftops off 14 units in an apartment complex behind the AMP. It peeled them right off in an old brown, like an old brown banana skin, and no one saw it coming. On that particular night in early August, the sky was the color of an oxidized penny, and the air was deathly still. Michael answered the door because his mother was in, at the mall and his father and Josh were right in the middle of jeopardy. Even a tornado advisory had, had it been bleeped in bold white letters across the bottom of the screen would not have interrupted their game. Michael knew the two men who stared back at him through the screen door. The younger, dressed in jeans and a t-shirt, was Doug Boyle. He had been with the police force for only a year. Michael and his friends had nicknamed him the Hangman because he made reputation he made his reputation catching kids who were drinking in the park, then booking them. Sometimes he waited patient as a cat in alleyways between the shops in town so that he could nail kids for speeding down Main Street. The older man, a man about Michael's father's age, wearing khaki slacks and a madras shirt, was Ralph Healy. He'd been a sergeant in, on the police force for as long as Michael could remember. At the sight of them, Michael's body grew rigid. He stared at the two men as if they had just announced their plans to torch the Mackenzie's house and everyone in it. We need to ask you and your family a few questions, Mike. Sergeant Healy said. He had his head, his head tipped slightly to the side, eyes narrowed. Michael knew he was being sized up. They're watching Jeopardy. Michael said, acutely aware of how stupid he must sound. It'll take only a couple of minutes, Healy assured him, strictly routine. And because there didn't seem to be any other course of action, Michael stepped back and let them in. Josh was so engrossed in his program that he didn't even look up when they entered the living room. Just talk, just talk loud, he told everyone, not bothering to turn the sound down on the TV. But as soon as the men announced that they were there about the ward case. He grabbed the remote on, and the TV screen went blank. Michael thought about going up to his room and letting his father handle the police, but he was afraid it might look suspicious. Besides, Ralph Healy had said he wanted to talk to all of them. So Michael look, took an inconspicuous seat in the corner of the room. Josh merely stayed in the same place on the floor, except that he now faced the other direction. Doug Boyle made himself at home on the couch without being asked, but Sergeant Healy extended his hand, squeezing Tom McKenzie's in a hearty shake. Sorry about the intrusion. Forget it. Have a seat. Michael's father pointed to the empty space next to Doug Boyle. I heard you guys had been asking questions around the neighborhood. Ralph Healy leaned forward, hands folded, elbows balanced on his thick knees, and nodded. The guys from... Picatinny finally zeroed in on the area where the bullet was fired from. They narrowed it down to four blocks. So you think somebody within from this neighborhood shot that gun? Tom McKenzie rubbed the palms of his hands along his thighs. Healy looked grim. Well, it sure looks that way, he said. That's why we're here. We've been doing the rest of the investigation on foot, asking the folks around here a few questions. Michael's father stared at the carpet but didn't say anything. Michael was suddenly aware that every muscle in his body, as if he were readying himself to, for an explosive takeoff from the starting block at a track meet. All his senses were attuned to, the he to Healy's every word, his every move, waiting. Ralph Healy had rough red hands. He kept them folded, fingers locked, as if he were, a he were about to pray. Michael found the image disturbing. I guess you've been following the case in the papers, Healy said to Michael's father. Everyone in town has, Josh volunteered. I mean, man, this is so cool. A murder right in Briarwood. Then he looked over his shoulder at Michael and gave him a shy grin, hinting that he knew something. Michael wanted to punch his lights out. Meanwhile, the three men were staring down at Josh as if he had just surfaced from somewhere beneath the carpet. Tom McKenzie glared at Josh. I hardly think someone dying, especially the way Charlie Ward did, could be described as cool. 
Watching his father and brother, Michael was suddenly aware that his father had not looked at, looked his way even once since the police had entered the room. It was as if he weren't even there. Such behavior was so out of character for his father that Michael began to wonder if he suspected something. You guys have any idea about what kind of gun it was? Tom McKenzie asked, turning his attention back to the two men. When Healy didn't say anything, Doug Boyle slid his wide backside forward on the couch as if he'd just decided to be a part of the investigation. We can't give out that information, he said. We're just asking people if they have any handguns or rifles in their house or if they know of anybody in the neighborhood who does. Ralph Healy parted his hands apologetically. It's a nasty business, asking people to point fingers. But if you know of anybody... A lot of people around here have rifles, Tom McKenzie said. I don't know about handguns. He frowned, looking skeptical. I've got two rifles of my own. Then he cocked his head toward Michael, and Mike's got an old forty five seventy Winchester his grandfather gave him. Michael's heart raced uncontrollably. A light sheen of sweat appeared on his upper lip and forehead. He was sure someone would notice. Ralph Healy eased his body back on the couch, as if he could relax now that he'd gotten what he'd come for. He sighed and looked toward the picture window. I'll need to see those rifles, he said. Then added, nothing personal. We just have to inspect everyone's guns. Michael watched as his father stood up, hands in pockets. He could tell his father had been caught off guard by the sergeant's request. Then he turned to Michael for the first time since the police had showed up. Better go get the Winchester, he said. Maybe it was something about the way his father said this. But at that single moment, Michael realized with horror that his father had at least considered the possibility that the shot had come from his own house. Michael licked his lips. It, it's not here, he said, surprised by the evenness of his own voice. His father stared back at him, hands still in his pockets. He shook his head as if he hadn't heard right. Where is it? Without a moment's hesitation, Michael said, at Joe's. His father continued shaking his head. He seemed bewildered. What's it doing at Joe's? Michael kept his eyes on his father's face. He was afraid that it, if he looked away, the gesture would scream his guilt. He shrugged as casually as he could, although the muscles in his shoulders and neck ached with tension. I loaned it to him. Tom McKenzie yanked his hand from his pocket and jerked his thumb in the direction of the cordless phone. Well, call him and tell him to get it over here. Michael could see that his father was upset. He couldn't be sure if it was only because his son had loaned out the rifle or because he sent something else. Michael picked up the phone and dialed Joe Sadowski's number. He wasn't worried. He knew Joe was at work. All he'd have to do is leave a message. But to his horror, Joe answered. I thought you'd be at work, Michael said, forgetting the others who stood only a few feet away. I got fired. Michael knew he would he should ask him what happened, but this was not the time. Somehow, he had to pull this thing off, and he had to make Joe play along. Listen, I need my rifle back. The silence lasted so long, he was afraid Joe had hung up. What in... Man, I don't have your rifle. Oh, man, you're kidding, right? Why didn't you tell me before, Michael said. My dad's going to be pissed. About what? I don't have your goddamn rifle. Joe drew a deep breath. Man, you're losing it. You're really losing it. Jesus, they stole it right out of the car? The desperation in Michael's voice was convincing. He was desperate, but not for the reasons the men standing behind him in the living room believed. Tell him to find the damn gun and get over here, Tom McGinsey said loudly. Now. Was that your old man? Joe asked. He's standing right there? What the? Michael looked over at his father. He can't, Dad. It was stolen. Tom McKenzie raked his fingers through his hair. Stolen? What? Who the hell stole it? He doesn't know. It was in the back seat of his car. Somebody broke in, took his CD player and the rifle. Ralph Healy took a step forward, coming within a foot of Michael. Did he file a report? Who was that? Joe said from some, from the other end of the phone. That wasn't your dad. I don't know, Mr. Healy, Michael said. Then to Joe, did you notify the police? The cops are there? Oh, man, 
Oh, man, we're screwed. Michael kept his gaze steady as he looked at Healy. He says it just happened last night. He hasn't had a chance to file a report yet.